So this is the question. You're going to buy yourself a new Apple MacBook Pro M1, Apple Silicon, and you don't know whether to go with the base 8GB of main memory or 16GB, which is the upgrade. Your main concern is running Logic Pro for music production, and maybe you dabble in a bit of Final Cut, and you also want the machine to be a good all-rounder also. Let's find out. Let's get into it. Hi there, my name is Mark Payne. We're going to be looking at memory pressure and the effect that Logic Pro has on the Apple MacBook when we run a full session configured with lots of native plugins. We're going to do performance testing on both an 8GB and 16GB configuration to see what the difference is. Okay, so before we get started, let's have a chat about how macOS looks after memory management. 30 years ago, before I started in audio, I was a system support engineer for Hewlett Packard looking after Unix operating systems. Although you could say that my knowledge is pretty much out of date, it's also likely to be true that operating systems are doing memory management in the same way as they always did. So if I take a book and I think of this as a program out on disk, when a computer runs it needs to bring that code into RAM, into its local storage. And there is no point when we run an application bringing the whole thing in because we won't need to run the whole program. We can't be omnipresent in the way that we run code. We basically run through the program in a kind of predefined way, pretty much like somebody would read a book, and we turn the pages. and. If we get to the point where in our memory we don't have a page we need, in operating system memory management this would be called a page fault. It doesn't mean anything's wrong, it just means that the page that we now need to access isn't actually been loaded into the local storage. So we bring it in, we page it in. Now it's likely that not only will we bring in the page that we need, but we will bring in a few pages afterwards because it's likely that we will need those as well. So over a period of time, the memory system basically is being filled with pages of code, data variables, shared memory, and cached information that the applications need to run most effectively. Even though you might stop using an application, the memory system isn't going to do anything about that. It's going to leave its pages resident in memory because it would be a waste of resources to deal with freeing those pages up when we don't need to. There is plenty of free memory, there is plenty of headroom to allow new applications to start and existing applications to expand as they do more work. This is a machine not under memory pressure where we would see green in that memory pressure line which we'll have a look at now. So the machine on test here is an Apple MacBook Pro M1 uh, with 16 gigabytes of memory. So let's take a look at it and get the baseline of where we're at before we look at an 8 gigabyte machine. So with this machine I've got a number of Office productivity tools running and then we're going to add to that uh, logic just to see what effect that has. Uh, we're running uh, Outlook and Safari which has got three tabs open. We're running QuickTime in the background because that's screen recording. We're also running uh, Excel, we're running Microsoft Teams, we happen to be running Zoom and Microsoft Word. Now we can look uh, at uh, Activity Monitor. Well, CPU is interesting, but you can see really the, uh, the CPU is under no particular load. And in terms of memory utilization, you can see that it is a 16 gigabyte machine and we've used uh, uh, 10 gigabytes of memory. That's not to say that 10 gigabytes is being actively used by these applications, it's just the amount of memory that's been paged in while they've been running and we see no reason to force any of it out of memory because this machine's not under memory pressure. There's a very nice green line here in the memory pressure area that indicates that the, there is no memory pressure going on. A machine is always going to try and use as much of the memory as we've given, given to it. It's a resource that you've purchased, so 
so um, we're going to use it all. That doesn't mean to say that we need to use it all, and that, that, that is the secret of understanding memory pressure. Okay, so in terms of looking at the programs themselves, and they are ordered here by their size in memory, we can see there's, n there's nothing here which is particularly large. You know, the largest program that we have has got a, you know, a 600 megabyte uh, residency in memory. Uh, what I want to do next is fire up logic. So let's do this. And while that's happening, let's watch for memory pressure. Uh, logic is starting. Uh, we're simulating here a system which is under a reasonable amount of load. Not only have we got uh, Logic running, but I've left all that stuff running in the background. Now you can see that Logic is significantly larger than any of the other programs. It's it's sitting there at uh, 3.8 uh, gigabytes of memory. And even when I started it, you can see the history going from left to right of memory pressure, and really nothing happened. There was no no there was no real measurement of memory pressure, even though we managed to start such a large program. The cached files has gone down slightly. We've obviously sacrificed some file system caching to the growth of the new arrival, the logic program. I've pretty much closed everything down now, so the machine is just running a couple of instances of uh, Microsoft OneDrive, which aren't particularly taxing. Let's have a look what happens when I simulate a machine which only has eight gigabytes of memory, if you're considering uh, buying the base machine. So how do I simulate that on a 16 gig machine? What I'm gonna do now is build a RAM disk, which is going to take up a fixed amount of memory in RAM and basically lock it out so it's uh, it's unusable by any other application. This disk util command here is going to create uh, something with this many blocks. Now a block on disk is uh, 2048k so if you do that maths this is going to end up being around 8 gigabytes. So if you look at uh, the memory utilization we're not under a uh, memory pressure and we've only used 5.54 um, uh, gigabytes of main memory and the reason for that is that this RAM disk, which is mounted, let me just bring it into view here, uh, is, is effectively a sparse construct. It's a file system, but uh, it won't take up space in memory until I actually put some real data in it. So let's do that now. I've got two four gigabyte files, which I'm going to copy into the RAM disk. And there's now a process appeared here called the Disk Images Helper, which is of around the size eight gigabytes. And also you'll notice that the memory used Used in this area down here is is jumped up to um, uh, 12 gigabytes uh, uh, total use. So now we are really running in a machine which has lost eight gigabytes of its memory, and everything now has to li to to live in the eight gigabytes that's left. And so very similar uh, to a machine if you were considering buying the base model. And let's go uh, with logic. Uh, so Logic Pro is just starting. Uh, remember I'm running Logic under Rosetta here because I've got a lot of uh, uh, non-recoded uh, uh, plugins and I'm finding that uh, the, the best and the most reliable way of running Logic in this situation is to run Logic Emulated. So Logic is now loaded and you can see that why that happened, uh, the system came under memory pressure and we're still in memory pressure. You can see that the yellow area here is a memory pressure warning where we are having to dedicate system resources to memory management. We have lost this headroom scenario where there's room for everybody. Now let's see what happens. Does uh, Logic run? Let's run the session and uh, you can hear uh, that that's running fine. Yes, uh, we, we seem to be uh, running fine. Even in this memory pressure situation, would an eight gigabyte machine run uh, uh, logic in this situation for you? Well, I think yes, it would. There, there would appear to be uh, no issues with running it, but I'm not sure I would be happy looking at a machine that was under that level of memory pressure all the time. So um, your mileage might vary because I, I, I don't just run logic. I also have other things going on. The more applications we start to run now, you know, uh, the more we might start to cause problems. So let me try and do some of that. I'm going to start Outlook, uh, Excel, uh, maybe Word, and start Microsoft Teams as well. In this situation, you can see now that we've had a system overload from Logic. It might be unfair because that might be because of CPU. As we as we launch these programs, that's quite heavy weight on the machine. So what I should try and do is just say okay to that, and then try running it again. Now you can see that. 
uh, really we are seeing quite high levels of CPU utilization uh, but we are running so uh, we've got that up and running again we have forced the machine into even more memory pressure by having these uh, applications running in the background but it's running so yes I can I can run a bunch of office productivity stuff and have logic running at the same time even on an 8 gigabyte machine so how do we conclude would I buy a MacBook Pro M1 with only 8 gigabytes of memory in it well for me personally I wouldn't I don't like seeing memory pressure uh, it winds me up and uh, I would much rather have a machine that has got memory headroom I think it future proofs it and I think the extra money that you spend on the uh, 16 gig machine you'll see that return to you when you come to sell the machine on in the future and the M1 is going to be such a successful machine any value that you invest into it I think you'll see back so if you can afford the cash then please put the 16 gigs in however I've also shown you that I'm running some quite serious Logic Pro sessions here with other things running in the background and the machine is managing to do that. And we haven't as yet applied some of the performance tips that we're going to look at in the next module. If you found this helpful, please hit like and subscribe to make sure that you don't miss any of the videos that I've got coming up in the future. And also in the link, you're going to find the next session where we're going to look at performance and tuning.